with logical equivalence and logical implication, we have the tools that we need to prove theorems. Now, that's what mathematicians do. We prove theorems by constructing proofs, and a proof is an airtight logical argument. Now, what's a theorem? Theorem is gonna be a statement T with two parts. One of the hypotheses of the theorem, it's gonna be a set of statements H sub I. We'll have the conclusion of the theorem, which is a statement C. So for a proof, we're gonna go from the hypotheses to the conclusion by setting up a string of logical equivalences or logical implications. Now, we'll say the theorem T is true if the statement H1 and H2 and H3 up through HN logically implies C. Recall, logical implication just means that C is true whenever all of the hypotheses are true at the same time. So for the truth table, what do we have? Well, the statement on the left is either true or false. For logical implication, okay, when they're all true at the same time, I want that the conclusion is true. If one of our hypotheses is false, then it's gonna turn out that the conclusion can be true or false, so the theorem will be inconclusive, okay? It won't say anything definite. Now, what's a proof? Okay, well, as we noted, a proof of our theorem T is just gonna be a sequence of statements or propositions that lead to our conclusion C. In the sequence, all of our statements will need to be valid. Okay, and valid just means from the following list. We can use any hypothesis, H sub I, we can apply any tautologies. We can use any substitutions. Okay, so from the last time I called these change of variable and change by logical equivalence. And we can use the rules of inference. So the idea is gonna be, as we progress through our proof, we're gonna generate a sequence of statements. Using these earlier statements P sub I, I can then use any Q that's inferred from the P sub I. So this is just saying I can use Q if we have that P1 and P2 up through P sub K logically implies Q. For our first example, let's consider the theorem. Okay, we'll have hypotheses P, P implies Q, Q implies R, and we'll want the conclusion statement R. So it would say this, if P, P implies Q, and Q implies R, then R. Now, for the proof, first what I'll do is, we announce that we're doing a proof, then we're gonna have a sequential list of valid statements. Now, for the first few statements, we list the hypotheses. So I'll have P, P implies Q, and Q implies R. Off to the right, for each valid statement, we'll put the reason why it's valid. So in this case, they're all by hypothesis. Now, to proceed, I'll wanna combine our hypotheses to create new valid statements. So in this case, we're just gonna use modus ponens. So if I have A and A implies B, that implies B. So for statement four, I'm gonna take P and P implies Q, by modus ponens, that implies Q. Then I could take Q with Q implies R. By modus ponens, that implies R. And that's a statement that we're trying to show. So that's our conclusion. So this gives a proof of our theorem. Okay, it's worth noting for statements four and five, okay, these are not in our hypotheses. Okay, these follow from the rules of inference. Now, if we want to make this a little bit more believable, let's put things into English. So we'll have actual statements here. So for instance, I could let P be, I wake up late, Q is I miss the bus, R is I walk to school. Then for the hypotheses we have, I wake up late. For P implies Q, I have if I wake up late, then I miss the bus. For Q implies R, I have if I miss the bus, then I walk to school. So if all three of these are true, then the conclusion is that I walk to school. 
Now, writing proofs is an art form. Not only do we want to be able to write good proofs, we also need to be able to identify mistakes in the proofs that we write. That takes experience, so until then, you'll need an expert to point out when you're doing things right and when you're doing things wrong. For our next example of a proof, let's consider the theorem. If P implies Q and R, Q or S implies T, and P or S, then we have conclusion T. We begin by listing our hypotheses, so those will be one through three. To proceed, I note, I want to work with Q and R, Q or S, and P or S. So, I want to work these into the picture. Now, to do that, we have to go through the rules for logical equivalence, logical implication, and the rules of inference. That's a lot to memorize up front, so until then, we'll just go through proofs, list the rules that we use, and with enough practice, you'll get better at knowing what rule to use. Now, if I want to get Q and R into the picture, I want to invoke the logical implication of simplification. So that says Q and R implies Q. Now, if I pair that with statement one, we'll have that P implies Q and R, Q and R implies Q, so P implies Q, and that rule is hypothetical syllogism. I could take this implication and add an or s to each side. So this can be done using constructive dilemma. And then finally, I can apply modus ponens twice. So we note from statement three, we have p or s. We have p or s implies q or s. By modus ponens, that implies q or s. Now I could take q or s. We have q or s implies t. By modus ponens, that implies t, and that's the conclusion we're trying to reach, statement t. So this is the proof of our theorem. Now, for a different kind of proof, okay, this is proof by contradiction, we're gonna need to review the logical equivalence of reductio ad absurdum. So what this says, if we have p implies q, that statement is logically equivalent to P and not Q implies a contradiction. Okay, remember contradiction just means statement is always false. Now, first let's just check this with the truth table and then we'll explain what this means for the proof. So we set up our truth table. I have P and Q. We take not Q, so false, true, false, true. We take P and not Q gives me false, true, false, false. Then, if we take this statement implying a contradiction, okay, so I have false goes to false is true, true goes to false is false, false goes to false is true, false goes to false is true, and we note this gives the same result as P implies Q. So they have the same truth table and thus logically equivalent. Now, Let's see how we get proof by contradiction from reductio ad absurdum. For a given theorem, we have hypotheses H sub i and a conclusion C. To show that our theorem is true, we want to show the statement that H1 and H2 up through H sub k implies C. If we apply reductio ad absurdum to this statement, we get the logically equivalent statement that H1 and H2 up through H sub K and not C implies a contradiction. Now, the idea here is if I have a collection of statements and we're able to derive a false statement from them, then one of the original statements must be false. And in this case, the only candidate is not C. So that means not not C is true or the conclusion is true and we have the proof of the theorem. Now, for a concrete example, let's consider our theorem from before. So if P, P implies Q, Q implies R, then R. We proceed as before. I'll start by announcing that I'm using proof by contradiction. Then we list the hypotheses. So P, P implies Q, Q implies R. 
for proof by contradiction, my next step is to negate the conclusion. So here we're going to assume not R is a valid statement. For the next step, I'm going to need to do some work on the side. So we go to our list of rules of inference, logical equivalences, and logical implications. The rule that I'm going to use is modus tollens. So this is the version of modus ponens for the contrapositive. So that says, if I have not R and Q implies R, we imply not Q. So the idea here would be, okay, we take the contrapositive Q implies R, we get not R implies not Q. We have not R, so modus ponens says not Q. Now, we can apply modus tollens again. I have not Q, okay, here I have P implies Q, so not Q implies not P contrapositive, so that'll give me not P. Finally, I put 1 and 6 together, so I can use conjunction, and that says that P and not P is a valid statement, but we know that this is a contradiction, okay, so this is always false. So that means I've derived a contradiction, and our conclusion must then be true, okay, so not, not R. Let's redo the second theorem using proof by contradiction. Recall the theorem is, if P implies Q and R, Q or S implies T, and P or S, then T. To start, we announce that we're using proof by contradiction. The first statements will be our hypotheses. So P implies Q and R, Q or S implies T, and P or S because we're using proof by contradiction, the next statement will just be the negation of our conclusion, so not T. Now, to proceed, we'll do some work off on the side to see how we get to our conclusion. So my first move is gonna to be to note, I have not T and QRS implies T. We can apply modus tollens to these two statements to get not QRS. So that'll be statement five. We hold on to that. Then I'm gonna use hypothesis one. So that says P implies Q and R. That's logically equivalent to P implies Q and P implies R. Now, my next move is gonna be simplification. So this statement logically implies P implies Q. Then I wanna add an or S to each side of the implication. We could do that using constructive dilemma. Now, we have P or S as one of our valid statements, so we can invoke modus ponens. So that'll say that this statement in P or S implies Q or S. And now we're gonna arrive at our contradiction. I have Q or S and not Q or S as valid statements. Okay, we put them together using conjunction, and this is gonna be a contradiction. So, we have a contradiction, which means, okay, the negation of the negation of our conclusion is true. So that means these hypotheses will imply T.